Shalom and welcome to an episode or an edition of TV7's My Brother's Keeper. I'm Jonathan Hassan, sitting in today for Michael Karam. And with me to uh, discuss today's topic is Reverend David Pileggi, um, who is the pastor in charge of Christ Church in the old city of Jerusalem. David, thank you so very much for joining me. And if you will, how about we open in prayer, uh, with prayer, ask the Lord to join us in uh, our conversation today and that this uh, uh, topic of discussion will deliberate a few challenges uh, of the body of Christ here in the land. Um, it will serve as a lesson and will mm -hmm. also encourage and, and um, trigger people to pray for the situation. Absolutely. But uh, as you said, let's begin with prayer. So Father in heaven, <clears throat> we come to you on behalf of your children the sheep of your pasture, um, especially those, Lord, now who are suffering or those who may be persecuted, those who live in hunger, those who live uh, in the midst of a war zone. Father, we confess that these things are huge and uh, we don't always know how to pray or what to do, but we ask that you would come to the rescue of your children those who are suffering, and those, Lord, those of us <clears throat> who live in comfort and safety. And Lord, for those who uh, do not uh, suffer from want or persecution, we ask that uh, you would animate us and guide us and direct us so that um, we can be responsible in the way that you have asked us to do uh, for those of our brothers and sisters who are in dire need. Lord, we pray that we will not be bystanders, we will not be apathetic, and Lord, we ask that we'll not be lazy. Again, Lord, we ask that you would challenge us and empower us uh, to do the right thing for those who are in dire straits. And we do ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, David, thank you again for, for being here. And uh, I'd like to uh, start. We spoke a little bit before today's program uh, to highlight the different points that we think should uh, uh, be brought up in today's um, discussion. And uh, as such, one of the key reasons for this program, uh, when I uh, initially envisioned it, was to provide us a clear understanding of reality on the ground and how to pray mm -hmm. for our brothers and sisters wherever they may be. Right. Uh, if uh, it's uh, Iranians or Syrians or Lebanese or uh, Egyptians or Israelis, uh, for that matter, how can we pray to stand with them? Now, uh, I'd like to focus today on the body of Christ here in the land, mm -hmm. uh, whether it is... Uh, Messianic Jews, Christians, uh, Palestinian Christians, Israeli Christians. Right. We have all denomination probably available in the land today. Right. Uh, um, there's not necessarily unity, mm -hmm. but there is some sort of unity mm -hmm. because we are a minority. Exactly. A very tiny, tiny, tiny minority. Right. Indeed. I think in, uh, within the state of Israel, uh, those who would call themselves believers or Christians would certainly be less than 2% of the population, if, if not less. And uh, so, yes, that does put a little bit of a, of a, of a different spin on things. And it uh, certainly uh, allows us uh, so many opportunities, but at the same time, uh, there, are many, uh, there are many difficulties, especially, I think, when it comes to being understood by the much larger Jewish and uh, Muslim communities. Yes, there's a great deal of misunderstanding about Christianity here mm. or uh, Messianic Judaism. And unfortunately, a lot of times this ignorance or in, and this misunderstanding uh, leads to not only prejudice, but at times uh, oppression uh, or pressure uh, on our small believing communities. and sometimes outright persecution. I think it's important to note, and, and this is something you highlighted earlier, and it is true. Um, of course, no government is perfect. No institution is perfect for that matter. But uh, when we're talking from an institution perspective, from the state of Israel, mm -hmm. um, there is no um, 
institutionalized persecution towards Christians. Yes, and you know, every any time you want to talk about the, the subject, uh, one has to be very, very careful. And mm. uh, I would urge your listeners also to be very careful. And uh, it's sometimes very easy to to want to demonize uh, Israel or to, to uh, demonize the Palestinians or the Muslims. But if we're trying to be um, cautious and at the same time truthful, it is certainly true, for which we're grateful, that uh, the, the, uh, the state uh, and the city uh, act in a fairly correct, positive way towards the Christian minority. And we can be grateful that uh, here in Israel, at least, that we uh, have a level of religious freedom, uh, cultural freedom that uh, doesn't exist uh, in many places, most places in the Middle East, and maybe even uh, some places uh, in the West. And so let me give you an example. This is not a legal example, but uh, it's something in the cultural context. Uh, Israel being fairly conservative, and getting more conservative all the time. It is very comfortable in most places and in most settings to talk about God or to talk about uh, religious faith or to talk about one's uh, interpretation of, of the Bible. And uh, I know many of my friends and family in the United States would be very cautious to do such a thing, for example, uh, in the States or virtually impossible in Europe. Mm -hmm. You talk about these things, you'd be you'd be scorned and uh, dismissed as a lunatic. So that's a certain cultural advantage that we have. And I think when you want to talk about uh, persecution, you need to talk about the culture uh, and the worldview uh, of the place where you live and not only the laws, the rules and regulations on the books. Indeed, there is right now, it's a cultural thing, as you say, and I, I very much believe in that as well from a global perspective. Persecution mm -hmm. is happening in America, it's happening in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, in Australia, everywhere. Absolutely. Uh, and Absolutely. whether it be culturally or the fact of the matter is when um, perceptions or ideals or ideas are trying to be manifested ideologically into reality, mm -hmm. this uh, not only once or twice, but systematically comes in collision uh, with biological truths, with faiths and and mm. uh, the foundations thereof, which is written in the word of God because God is truth. Mm -hmm. So ultimately this uh, brings about a lot of friction from that perspective. But when we're looking here in the land, there is a lot of spiritual warfare when we're talking about uh, the different locations mm -hmm. where uh, certain momentous events mm -hmm. took place, including, of course, a Temple Mount and mm -hmm. um, other locations throughout the land, which bring about a lot of tension and friction between the mm -hmm. three monotheistic religions, right. even though being the minority in that equation, not globally, but locally, right. uh, also draws physical, verbal, and uh, mental abuse to mm -hmm. a certain degree. That's correct. What can you tell us about that? Your church in particular also was just recently threatened to be burned down. Oh my goodness. Yes, I'm again, to, to, to talk about these things without really a mature or nuanced awareness of, uh, of history is uh, very difficult because everyone wants a soundbite. They want a 15 second soundbite. Indeed. And uh, I would uh, hope and pray that uh, those who are going to be committed intercessors uh, would be able to pray in an intelligent way beyond mm. the sound bites. They would be able to uh, hear God, be directed by the Holy Spirit, and know how to pray in a way that's uh, sensitive and even reflects uh, reflects the heart of God. So to answer your question uh, in that way, there is a, a, a lot of, you might say, um, political issues which get mixed with religion. And let's be really honest and truthful, it is probably totally impossible to separate religion and politics. People say, I, I don't like when the two mix, but I think as human beings, it's not, not totally possible to do such a thing. 
Uh, secondly, we um, <clears throat> the political context is the Arab uh, Israel uh, context. I would say, thirdly, there is a um, uh, a certain um, historical, um, you might say, animosity between certain groups between between Muslims and Jews, Jews and Christians, uh, uh, etc. And uh, some groups, some Christian groups, Jewish groups, Muslim groups, feel like they have a settle to a score to settle. They they need to somehow make up for. Uh, compensate for what's happened in the past, and uh, that attitude is very often reflected uh, in the hostility uh, between uh, one group or another. Yes, indeed. And uh, again, this is a, we need people who are mature to understand this, and it takes maturity to pray, and it takes a certain long historical view to know how to speak and act about these things. Nonetheless. Um, Action is is necessary Absolutely. when we're talking about those realities. And again, it is not an institutional state-related um, engagement, if you will, but rather small groups, including two groups uh, um, that were recently very active uh, mm -hmm. on different playing fields. Mm -hmm. Also in the Jerusalem Day, of course, the, the uh, uh, flag march or flag parade, however mm -hmm. it's uh, called uh, in English. Uh, these groups utilized the celebration of the reunification of Jerusalem in order to spell fear and violence and, and mm -hmm. uh, target uh, non-Jewish communities there and mm -hmm. it was both ways of course there are groups also uh, Muslim groups of uh, this kind but when we're talking about those two groups subsequently we heard Defense Minister Benny Gantz even called to redefine those two groups as terror mm -hmm. organizations right. so it is something that the state is recognizing the problem with those mm -hmm. groups and how to deal with them uh, let me just add that uh, on paper, the, the the laws of the state of Israel are a model, and they're uh, maybe exemplary, especially for uh, for the region in which we live. But uh, with the Christian community, especially being such a tiny minority, we really don't come on to the radar screen of uh, most officials or uh, bureaucrats, and uh, therefore our problems uh, are somehow. Um, ignored or or not uh, taken very seriously, and uh, we would like, as the Christian community, for the state to be more active, mm -hmm. uh, to be uh, certainly to be more involved, to take more of an interest in uh, the the issues that uh, concern our communities, and so um, we need a uh, higher level engage of engagement, you know, by the state. And of course, I do realize, uh, and I think your listeners need, need to realize that uh, the state apparatus in Israel has to deal with inc an incredible number of issues, most of them emergencies, you know, day in and day out. Uh, Not just ex issues, but complexities. <clears throat> complexities. Someone Indeed. once described life, life in Israel as a routine emergency, yes. Mm. Uh, and so we're, we're not uh, tr trying to be unrealistic here. But we do think that uh, it's important for the state of Israel to uh, safeguard the Christian minority and to provide ways in which uh, the community can feel secure. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the so-called um, persecution, whatever you might want to call it, or um, uh, some of it causes a great deal of anxiety mm -hmm. and insecurity in a very, very tiny, com shrinking community in this part of the world. When we're looking at the, the variables, of course, there is uh, there are organizations such as One for Israel that has uh, faced some court uh, uh, challenges from the ultra orthodox community that sought to target them for mm -hmm. evangelistic work right. uh, directed at minors, which is right. uh -huh. un not legal in, in right. the country. Uh, nonetheless, they won that court case, uh, mm -hmm. praise God, which did not set precedent against the body of Christ here right. in the land. There are other challenges that we're talking about uh, from a holistic level mm -hmm. uh, when we're looking at right. just the perception and understanding, the education in the land directed at, at Christians mm -hmm. um, is very limited 
and not in a positive lens. So maybe it's an educational issue that we need to look at. It, it is in part an educational issue. And uh, the state of Israel, uh, I believe uh, they need to uh, train and to sensitize uh, their bureaucrats, uh, of, uh, officials, um, in a better way, because uh, oftentimes when we go to one government office or another, uh, we find not so much hostility, but we find the uh, ignorance of Christianity and the needs of the Christian community uh, to be astounding. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of stereotypes and myths, and uh, these are just not very helpful uh, in getting the state, for example, to fairly apply the law. Um, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the small minority mm. of Christians that live here. Indeed. Now, I know there are some senators and, and members of parliament uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere that watch this program, and I'm sure that this information provides them some insight and understanding on how to <clears throat> approach this topic when speaking with their counterparts here. Mm -hmm. But to what degree do you think that we as, as believers throughout the world can engage in prayer. How should we engage in prayer? You spoke about in, an intelligent mm -hmm. engagement. Yeah. How can we approach uh, our Heavenly Father and say, Lord, use us, mm -hmm. intervene, mm -hmm. take control of this situation, because we know he is in control. Right. You know, um, it. I, I think it's, uh, it, it is a little complicated, and I would hope and uh, trust that... Uh, and here I'm speaking to mature intercessors, that uh, first and foremost, for example, when we sit down to pray uh, for our brothers and sisters in India, that we would pray uh, with the leading of the Holy Spirit, mm. right? God, what is it that you want to do through your people, in your people, uh, the body of Christ, in the nation of India? And uh, sometimes it will be praying, for, you know, for a change of government or, or whatever that may be. And sometimes it's oftentimes, and this is uh, perhaps uh, cheap and easy for us to say because here we live in relative uh, peace and, and, uh, and safety, but uh, sometimes it's uh, through oppression and persecution uh, that the gospel spreads. Uh, I once heard a Iranian man who posed a challenging question uh, to us, uh, a, a group of Christians here in Jerusalem, and this Iranian man asked, "Who has, uh, is the has been who has been the most effective evangelist? Yes, in the entire Middle East for the last two thousand years." And we all tried to scratch our head, and we tried. I think people tried to think of one missionary or another missionary or one uh, institution or another. Uh, and he said, no, you know, he said the most effective evangelist has been the Ayatollah Khomeini. And mm -hmm. the Ayatollah Khomeini in his extremism, yes, uh, and in his, uh, uh, the way that he ruled Iran has driven more Muslims uh, to faith in Jesus uh, than any other person at any other time any other time in history. So, yep. you know, to say, okay, well, I'm going to pray against the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, may not be, you know, God's will. To pray for, for those people who are undergoing persecution, that they'll have grace and provision and uh, to be able to do it joyfully might be the thing to pray. So I think every situation is, is a little bit different. Khomeini, of course, was replaced later with Khamenei, who followed up. And uh, it is amazing to see what's happening in Iran, uh -huh. uh, to see th so many people. We have also viewers from Iran um, who who watch us and, and have already told us that they came to faith after uh, an extensive time of hatred mm -hmm. towards Christianity, hatred towards the right. West, towards... Everything that they're being taught uh, mm -hmm. drives them towards that, even though there are some liberties in Iran. Of course, not everything is black and white, and, and Iran is right. uh, quite a great nation with wonderful people. But so many people are coming to faith to de the degree that the RGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, mm -hmm. and the Basij, uh, another element within uh, the revolutionary regime, 
are actively persecuting and trying to stem out Christianity because they see this as one of the greatest threats to the uh, Ayatollah regime in Tehran. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, in, a, in, a, in an ironic way, they brought it upon themselves. Right? Absolutely. Uh, n- the Islamic, more than that. The Islamic yeah. revolution, like all revolutions, uh, ends up uh, fraying and uh, falling apart from within. Mm. Well, amen. Uh, Unless it's, of course, God's revolution. Yes. So I'd like to, um, uh, because we don't have very much time left, we have about six uh, minutes or so. Mm-hmm. Where do we engage in that prayer um, when we're talking specifically about Israel, about mm-hmm. the peace of Jerusalem? Psalm 122 says, Sha'alu shalom Yerushalayim, mm-hmm. ask for the peace of Jerusalem. Right. Yeshal yu avai, which mm-hmm. ultimately means... Uh, you will prosper from a spiritual perspective, right. shalva, right. Uh, which uh, is something that uh, uh, we all seek, mm-hmm. God's peace. Right. And uh, how can we approach it from that perspective? Okay, so if, uh, if you will allow me for, uh, for a minute. The, um, the psalm uh, tells us, you know, that we should <clears throat> pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I think, for two reasons. One, because the Lord's people are there. And it's a very good uh, reason that uh, here we have a city of flesh and blood, uh, a city of uh, Jewish people and Muslim people. Um, uh, We want God to to be merciful uh, to this city, yes, uh, where we don't pray uh, in in a way that uh, we're trying to uh, condemn or to to bring judgment. And just as as Jesus did from the Mount of Olives, I think all of us should cry over Jerusalem, weep over the city. Uh, Of course, weep over the city, uh, our own cities, uh, which we live at the moment as well. But secondly, it says uh, we're going to pray for, seek the peace of Jerusalem for the sake of the house of the Lord. And uh, here I think is something really critical that many people, um, that many people forget about, yes, that uh, Jerusalem, whether, and I'd like to speak to, 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 to the, broad, the broadest possible um, Christian audience, <clears throat> no matter what you think about Jerusalem, whether you have a romantic idea or you have some kind of uh, notion or understanding that there's going to be a fulfillment of prophecy here, Jerusalem is connected to the name of God. And if you ask most people around the world uh, if they connect God with Jerusalem or Jerusalem with the Bible or Jerusalem with the, uh, they'll say yes, it it has this connection. And if there's fighting and struggling and strife going on in this city, it actually leads, I believe, to a desecration of God's name or people question, uh, you know, uh, God's uh, connection, perhaps, with the city and even with the with the Jewish people. And again, you might say, "Well, I don't believe it. I don't like it. I don't think Jerusalem is. It's, why is Jerusalem more important than Miami Beach?" And a, a lot of my friends might might say something like this. But again, God's reputation is at stake here. And uh, I think, for the sake of the name of the Lord. Uh, it is one important reason why we need to uh, we need to pray for pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It is very very critical, very important. And by the way, I think we should pray for the Baptist Church. People might be saying, "I'm not a Baptist. I don't agree with them." Catholic Church. I'm not a Catholic. I don't. Uh, you know. Well, and in the minds of most people, the Baptist Church or the Catholic Church has something to do with Jesus. And uh, if the Baptists and the Roman Catholics don't behave in a Jesus-like way, it uh, brings desecration to his name. We, mm-hmm. say we can't choose who, you know, uh, is going to be a witness. But we need to pray uh, for, uh, f- for our witness. We need to pray for the body of Christ, the body of the Messiah, here that uh, we will uh, live and act in a uh, godly, holy way. Um, that will uh, bring glory to God and pray for all the all the uh, pray for God's mercy on the city and for all the people who live here. Amen. Amen. Yes, unity is, is vital. You know, it's uh, very important. You said that uh, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, there is too much 
hatred within the body of Christ mm -hmm. toward <clears throat> one denomination or another. I don't think I entered one single church where I agreed with everything that was said. Right. Uh, and that is something that I always keep in mind when I communicate with uh, anyone right. about uh, our faith. And uh, ultimately, uh, you know, uh, my mother, oh, bless her heart, she's Protestant. I grew up Protestant within the Protestant right. environment. But my father came to faith through a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. So uh, he grew up into Christianity uh, and was introduced to Christianity uh, through the Catholic Church. Right. So th there is uh, an understanding that ultimately God uses all the various denominations mm. that seek him, that preach him, mm. and ultimately seek to represent him here on earth. We are his ambassadors here on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean that I agree with everybody Good. around me. I, I don't think I know too many people I agree with right. on every single level. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, we, through in spirit and in truth, we seek to love one another, mm -hmm. to encourage one another, and to stand for one another. And when we're talking about persecution, and I think that... Uh, People from around the world, our, our brethren and sisters around the world, need to understand this very clearly. From the outside perspective, there is no Catholic, there is no Protestant, mm -hmm. there is no Baptist, uh, a Pentecostal, or anything. We're all Christians, period. Mm -hmm. And we'll be uh, regarded as such, and, mm -hmm. and uh, people act to us mm -hmm. in this manner. Mm -hmm. um, a closing sentence, very shortly, uh, what should we pray for today? Again, first and foremost, we pray for the, uh, the believing community and uh, that God will give us an opportunity uh, to be w w uh, a witness in this city as, uh, and in this country and to do so in a positive way that will bring uh, glory to the name of the Father and to the name of the Son. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, it's been a blessing having you here, and I'd like to thank our viewers as well. Uh, God bless you, and we will see you next time for yet another uh, segment of My Brother's Keeper. Shalom.